Hello, and welcome to Adventures in Neuropathology with your favorite neuropathologist, Andrea Gilbert. So today we're going to be talking about an unfortunate case of a patient who had received uh, radiation therapy as a child for uh, treatment of leukemia. It cured the leukemia. She, she grew up and uh, she's now uh, middle-aged. Um, but unfortunately, she developed uh, several brain tumors in the area that uh, received the radiation as a child. So this is not common. Um, radiation is a double-edged sword in that it has helped a lot of people. It has cured a lot of people of cancer. It has done a world of good. But there is a little bit of a dark side to it in that sometimes the uh, cells that have received radiation, the normal, the normal tissue that has received radiation, sometimes that tissue can uh, be injured and the DNA can be altered and that can spur development of, uh, of a new tumor growth. Um, so a different tumor arises uh, in the field of radiation that that person had uh, received radiation in that area of the body for treatment of the first tumor and ends up developing uh, into a second tumor. So let's take a look at uh, the uh, tumor for this patient and then also take a look at um, the effects of radiation in the surrounding brain. Um, so when the surgeon was taking out the, the, the tumor, it was, it's very difficult to tell where the tumor ends and where the brain begins uh, grossly because everything's all stuck together uh, as an effect of the radiation. Um, and so as a result of that, what we have are uh, several uh, fragments of brain in this uh, tumor resection where we can definitely see the effects of radiation. Um, so we'll go through that. So let's get started. So there are a lot of interesting things about this case. Uh, the actual diagnosis itself is um, uh, it's a meningioma, so it's a very typical appearance here uh, of a meningioma. We've got syncytial cells, uh, syncytial cytoplasm, where it's hard to tell where one cell ends and the other begins. There was a little bit of small cell change where the NC ratio is a little bit increased, um, but other than that, there, there wasn't really a whole lot uh, to the actual tumor itself. Um, however, there were uh, some very interesting findings in the tissues around the tumor. So here's an example here. We're, we're looking at the tumor on the right-hand side of the screen, and we've got this kind of worrisome um, uh, small cell change, but there was, no, there was nothing else worrisome about this tumor. Um, and then here on the left side of the screen, we have uh, cortex, and the cortex has this, uh, these calcifications here, which in, in the neuropathology world, when we see uh, calcifications, that's usually an indicator of chronicity or some sort of chronic uh, 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 process. Um, and then here we have some macrophages, which indicates that uh, maybe there is some necrosis or hemorrhage uh, previously. Um, uh, here, this, this is where things start to get interesting. There's a little cleft here, but I think that this is artifactual where the uh, uh, tissue during processing kind of shrinks away from each other. Uh, this tumor is very much adherent to this brain. It's going uh, right along with the, the brain. And the brain is uh, not invaded, but it is very much adherent to the tumor and also to the dura. So uh, where I have my uh, pointer right now is looking at the um, uh, 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 the 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 dura and the. Um, uh, brain tissue. And uh, what this would look like macroscopically is uh, when the surgeons get in there, they would have a hard time finding a plane of section between the brain and the dura and the brain and the tumor. Um, and so uh, a higher power view of this is showing the brain tissue and it's not, it's not uh, exactly normal. It's got some reactive change. So we can see the, the uh, cell bodies of the astrocytes here and we shouldn't be able to see that. So astrocytes, microscopically, astrocytes should really look like um, raisins thrown on a bed of cotton candy. <laughs> 
where you can see the the nuclei, but you shouldn't be able to see the cell bodies because they're uh, they they just kind of blend uh, inconspicuously with the background neur neurofil. But here we can see those cell bodies, and this is uh, gliosis. And macroscopically, what that would look like is uh, the the uh, the brain would have a little bit more of a firm feel to it. Um, here is another uh, appearance of the uh, brain tissue, and I wonder if this was an area of adherence between the brain tissue and the, and the overlying dura, where maybe the brain was trying to move just a little bit, and this was an anchor point. So we've got quite a bit of, um, of a prominent uh, gliosis where the uh, brain is adherent to the overlying dura. And so uh, this is one of the major issues with, uh, with radiation uh, uh, treatment is that everything starts to stick together. And any surgeon will tell you that a patient who has had radiation to a certain area, the, the, the tissues within that area, they tend to stick together uh, and they become really adherent together. And it's hard to, to work with those tissues because everything just is very... Um, uh, stuck together. And that's what we're seeing here. This is a microscopic appearance of what those tissues look like uh, after they've been irradiated and everything is just sticking together. So a, a little bit more, uh, uh, when we look at the underlying brain tissue, there's a little bit of this hyalinization, but not, not too bad, not like what we were seeing in the prior case. I just wanted to go through this really quickly. There was a, there was a study that was done, uh, an exhaustive review that was done of about 251 cases. Um, and this was a pretty stringent uh, criteria. Basically, the, uh, they required that all the tumors that they looked looked at, uh, they must have been within the irradiated field. There had to have been a sufficiency late latency period between irradiation and the tumor development. Um, the radiation-induced tumor uh, uh, had to be of different uh, histologic type. So basically, the histology of meningioma had to be verified microscopically, and then that had to be a different diagnosis from all the other tumors. Um, and uh, these patients must not have had any other uh, diseases that would be uh, uh, predisposing to tumor formation like Lee-Fraumini. And uh, what they, they saw for radiation-induced meningiomas, just as a reminder, this uh, person had received radiation uh, uh, early on for, I, I think it was leukemia. Uh, and so uh, for radiation-induced uh, meningiomas, what we had was uh, uh, many of the patients had a hematologic malignancy, things like uh, leukemia, primarily in childhood. Uh, this uh, particular study uh, did not uh, 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 discriminate based on uh, time of uh, publication. So it included uh, several cases where the um, uh, people had been treated with radiation for pituitary adenoma, also uh, tinea. Um, and what they found was that the grade three tumors, uh, they tended to have a shorter latency period uh, than the lower grade uh, tumors. Um, and uh, another uh, thing here is that the, um, the, the grade of the tumor was uh, uh, partially dependent on the dose of radiation, uh, where the higher doses uh, 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 were uh, uh, grade three tumors were more prone to develop uh, if the patient had received higher doses. Okay, so that was our tour of uh, development of a tumor in a person who had received radiation uh, many years prior. So this is a rare occurrence, but it's very well described. Uh, Radiation-induced meningiomas, they do happen, uh, but uh, very uncommon. So this has been our whirlwind tour of radiation-induced meningiomas. This is a part two of a three-part series of uh, radiation and uh, brain tumors. Part three is our grand finale, so be sure to check it out. We're going to be talking about brain tumors in outer space. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our channel, uh, Adventures in Neuropathology. You can um, see us on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. All right, that's it. Thank you.